Hey, this is the HVAC School Podcast, and this short episode is on low ambient cooling. But before we get into that, I want to thank our sponsors, Field Peace. They make the Job Link Probes with the best in class Bluetooth range. If you haven't taken a look at the Job Link Probes, you can find them at truetechtools.com. Use the offer code Get Schooled for a great discount. We've been using them, we're making a few videos with them showing you their use and some different applications, and we've been very happy with them. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, NAVAC, navacglobal.com. They make recovery machines, vacuum pumps, a lot of other great tools. They're a little hand swedge, a little tool bag size swedge. It is very nice to have in the tool bag if you want to make a quick swedge. The technique's a little different. you got to kind of rotate it and gently do it as you go around. And I have actually made some swedges on aluminum tubing using that hand swedge just by preheating the tubing a little bit because aluminum is tricky, but uh, had good results with that tool. You can find all the tools, again, at True Tech Tools. Offer code, get schooled. Also, refrigeration technologies at refrigetech.com, owned by John and Mike Pastorello. Great family business in California. They make really good chemicals that you're going to enjoy using. They're not out there dead set on killing you like many other chemicals are. They don't have some of the toxic odors and things that you may be used to. They're great products. They go by the brand name Viper. They also have Nylog, Big Blue, Leak Reactant, many other products. You can find out more by going to refrigetech.com or truetechtools.com also carries those. I also want to thank Solder Weld and AccuTools, makers of BlueVac. They are companies that we've been working closely with and we really like their products. And finally, new sponsor, Speed Clean. Speed Clean is a new sponsor of the podcast. We're glad to have them on board. And Speed Clean makes a lot of different products, specialty products for cleaning. They make a special kit for cleaning condensers. They make a special kit for cleaning ductless systems, a bib kit that goes underneath ductless systems, and many other products, including the new dry steam cleaner that they make. I think it's going to be especially great for commercial refrigeration applications. You can find out more by going to speedclean.com. That's speedclean.com. And always... Carrier, carrier carrier.com. Our first sponsor and sponsor that stuck with us all this time. Thank you to Carrier. All right, so today we are talking about low ambient cooling. So specifically low ambient cooling. We're not talking about running a heat pump in heat mode. That's a different thing. We've talked about that on other short episodes and other long episodes. But we were looking over, we were doing a read through with our installers of some of the install manuals for some of the heat pumps that we install and straight cool units. And one thing that came up in both of them was low ambient operation. It's one of the things of which if you're meaning to operate a piece of air conditioning equipment, in this case, carrier, I think 25 HCE series there, it says that you should not operate them below 55 degrees outdoor ambient. And generally speaking, anytime you get below 65 degrees, it can become a problem in certain types of equipment. And so you have to use certain accessories if you're trying to operate down below 50 degrees or 55 degrees in that particular piece of equipment. And obviously different units vary. You will have some units that have built-in controls that will help deal with low ambient. But the first question that came up in the class, one of the technicians asked, well, why would you want low ambient cooling? What's the application? And there's a couple key applications. In commercial, there's many applications. In commercial, you generate a lot more uh, heat inside the building with equipment. That can be things like computers, server rooms, generate a lot of heat, kitchen equipment. In a lot of cases in commercial applications, you're going to have a lot more occupancy density. Again, on average, people produce about 500 BTUs per hour per person. It's sort of an average. I think it's actually like 470 or something like that. But right around 500 is what we'll generally think of for people who are doing just very simple, basic tasks, but it can be a lot more than that if people are moving around, gym, something like that. So you you tend to have these different heat gains. So equipment, electronics, people. And so in many cases, you will need to still cool the space even when the outdoor ambient temperatures, the outdoor temperatures are a little bit lower. And this is where, uh, if you think of economizers in certain markets are used a lot, where you bring in free outdoor cooling. But in a lot of cases, you have equipment that can't really utilize an economizer And so sometimes you just have to run the air conditioning, running in cool mode, when the outdoor ambient temperature is low. Also, in some residential situations, we had a customer who had a bunch of terrariums inside their house. So these are basically aquariums for reptiles. And so they have all these heat lamps and things. And there was all this internal heat load. And they were trying to operate their AC equipment below the recommended outdoor temperatures. And so when you run into these circumstances where people are dead set on running cooling equipment when it's cooler outside, either by necessity or by desire, you've got to do some things to the equipment if it's just typical AC equipment. 
And we also run into it, obviously, in refrigeration, market refrigeration or commercial refrigeration. Mechanics of all stripes are used to having to operate their equipment in a much wider range of conditions. Because let's say that you have a remote condenser on a restaurant in a state that has snow and ice and all that stuff, unlike what we have here in Florida. You still have to run the freezer inside the restaurant, regardless of whether it's cold outside or not. And so you have to have controls that allow it to function in all of those different circumstances. So let's first talk about what happens when the outdoor ambient temperature goes down, because you know the goal of the condenser, the condenser we call the heat rejector in my basics class, he's the heat rejector, evaporator is the heat absorber. So you got to absorb heat into the evaporator, you got to reject it at the condenser. And the way we reject and absorb heat is through the condensing and boiling of refrigerant by the control of its pressures. So we have to have a pressure differential between the high side and the low side. Specifically, one way of saying this is we have to have a pressure drop across the metering device. One kind of old school way of saying it is you had to have a 100 PSI pressure drop across the metering device. And of course, that's just a rule of thumb and it varies based on the refrigerant and the conditions and a lot of other things. So that's really, you can kind of throw that out the window. But depending on the application, you, of course, need to have some pressure drop. And depending on the type of system, you may have as low as maybe 50 PSI in some cases. And in some cases, you may have higher than that. But regardless, you got to have a differential between the high side and low side of the system. It doesn't work otherwise. You lose control. And so in order to operate during low ambient conditions, because we're rejecting heat to the outside, when you have more heat rejection because of lower temperature conditions, what occurs is, is your head pressure drops. That's the result. So your head pressure drops and also your condensing temperature drops. And so now you end up with relatively or very low pressures that then don't result in the pressure drop that you need. Because using refrigeration as an example, we have a pretty fixed evaporator temperature that we need in refrigeration. When that system's operating, you really need that evaporator temperature to be a set temperature. And so you take the design box temperature, you subtract the design temperature difference, and that evaporator temperature needs to be whatever it is. So as an example, let's say you have a box that you want to have at, we'll say, negative 10. We'll just use that as an example. And if you have a design temperature difference of 10 degrees, that means that you need to have a negative 20 degree evaporator coil. You can't really fluctuate that too much. Otherwise, it's not going to cool the product properly. In air conditioning, we're used to having our suction temperature, or our, I should say our evaporator temperature, float quite a bit more because we're used to it floating with that in changes in the indoor temperature. And so we can deal with a little bit of floating in our suction pressure, but still we have a very key limitation in air conditioning. If you think of air conditioning as high temp refrigeration, it's the same basic thing. We have this limitation in that we don't have a defrost cycle for the evaporator coil. So you cannot run a lower than 32 degree evaporator coil. You just can't do it. If you do that, then eventually you're going to build up ice and the coil is going to freeze over and then you're going to lose your airflow and it's not going to work. So we can have some fluctuation in our evaporator temperature, otherwise known as our suction saturation, and they're not always exactly the same. In fact, somebody pointed out to me the other day that there's a difference between the skin temperature of the evaporator tubing and fins and the actual refrigerant inside the evaporator. And of course, there's definitely truth to that and it varies. But as far as we're concerned, when we say evaporator temperature, we're generally talking about our suction saturation. We measure our suction pressure, we convert that to the saturated temperature, depending on the refrigerant, and we call that our evaporator temperature. So for all intents and purposes, that's the way we're going to think about that. And so we allow that to float a little bit in air conditioning. But again, you have to maintain above that 32 degrees, otherwise you're going to have problems. That's the point. So we have to keep our head pressure up to a certain degree. And that's what it comes down to. So ultimately, we have to choose how are we going to keep our head pressure up and how are we going to prevent our coil from freezing in air conditioning during low temperature applications. So there's some common ways. I'm just going to go over them very quickly. First is, which has nothing to do with the head pressure, it's just to prevent the freezing, which is sort of the symptom. It's like taking a ibuprofen. That is to install some form of freeze protection. A common form of freeze protection is a clicks-on type device, we call them a freeze stat. We mount it on the suction line right on the outlet of the evaporator coil. And then when that suction line gets to a temperature that equates to freezing, then it shuts off the condenser. So you break Y with that. So you break the yellow circuit, shuts off the condenser until the temperature rises enough that it makes again. And usually there's something like a 5 to 10 degree swing in it. I'm not looking at one right now, but there's a swing there so that it, before it makes again, that evaporator coil has to warm up significantly. So that's one way to prevent the freezing, which is sort of the symptom. But how do you deal with the actual cause? Well, the way to deal with the cause is by getting our head pressure up. We essentially have three different ways that we get our head pressure up in a regular operational manner. 
And it's all based on, again, getting our head pressure up in the liquid line. That's what we care about because, again, you can get your head pressure up in the discharge line. It has to translate to a pressure drop at the metering device because that's where it matters. It doesn't matter what it is in the discharge line. It matters what it is in the liquid line before it gets to that metering device so you can have that required pressure drop. The first two strategies rely on affecting the condenser fan in some way. And the first one is a very simple one. It's called a fan cycling control. Fan cycling control, you just set it up to turn the fan on and off. And usually it's a pressure activated device. I imagine you could do it with temperature in some way, but we do it in a pressure activated manner. So we try to maintain a fixed pressure in that condenser. So you kind of set a minimum that the condensing pressure is going to be. And so what will happen is once it drops below that, it's going to shut off the condenser fan. It'll let it get up to a point and then it will turn it back on again. And it'll just keep going on and off, on and off, on and off until you are low enough ambient conditions that potentially speaking, you would have a situation where the condenser fan would just stay off. And that does happen in some circumstances. So that's fan cycling. Challenge with fan cycling is it's sort of jarring to the system because of these constantly changing pressures. And so your expansion valves are going to be hunting and you're going to have some challenges associated with that. It's especially frowned upon in refrigeration because it's going to throw around your evaporator temperatures. They're going to be fluctuating. It's not going to be good for the product. In air conditioning and residential applications, especially it's popular. You'll see it in commercial applications as well in air conditioning, where you just have fan cycling controls. One way that works better is when you have multiple condenser fans. So once you have a RTU or something, or a large split that has multiple condenser fans, then you can fan cycle one or two of them and still have some others. Or you can stage the fan cycling where you have two go off first and then the other two or whatever the case may be. And so that way you don't have quite the massive fluctuations. You still have some fluctuations, but it won't be so extreme as shutting off the condenser fan completely. And the next way is where you're modulating your condenser fan speed. Carrier calls this a motor master control. And when you're modulating a typical motor by essentially just decreasing the voltage going to it, that's how they do it. That's not particularly good for the motor. So carrier, for example, when you use a motor master control, they require you to put in a ball bearing motor because the ball bearing motor is going to withstand those changes a little better than a typical sleeve bearing motor. It's going to be much better on the system from a standpoint of stability because it's going to modulate the speed of that fan motor. Still not my favorite. It's not a very electrically efficient way of doing it, but it does function in certain cases. You're generally going to see that on smaller equipment. And then the more common one that we see now in grocery refrigeration and a lot of other applications is using a variable frequency drive. If you use a variable frequency drive with a three-phase motor that's designed to be used with a variable frequency drive, then you can really vary the speed of those motors to greatly impact your pressure to get it really where you want it. And generally speaking, the goal still in refrigeration and air conditioning is still to allow the head pressure to go as low as you can because lower head pressure equates to lower compression ratio which equals better efficiency. So we don't want to drive head pressure up any more than we need to. Our goal is to use what we've got and not have to mess around with the equipment and change how it's functioning unless you get to a point where it's not going to function properly. And so the goal is to allow the head pressure to drop. The older strategies would be to hold it all the way up at 105 degree condensing temperature or something or a condensing temperature that equated to a 90 degree day or something like that, 90, 95 degree day. Uh, nowadays, we generally allow that head pressure to drop to the point where it's still functional, but allows it to drop down where you do take advantage of some of those lower compression ratios, especially in refrigeration, like I said. All these things are more critical generally in refrigeration. And also, they tend to be operated in a much wider range of conditions. You might have a negative 10 degree day and you still have to operate your refrigeration freezers in a grocery store, for example. The next way that's used, and this is also very common in refrigeration, would be what we call a headmaster. So motor master and headmaster, two different things. Motor master varies the speed of a motor. I think that's a carrier term. I don't know if others use that term. But headmaster is essentially just a valve that allows discharge gas to enter what we call the drop leg, which is the leg between the condenser and the line and between the condenser and the receiver. In large grocery store refrigeration, you're generally going to have your condensers on top of your rack house or on top of a building, and then you're just going to go down a drop leg, which is a liquid line, but it's the liquid line between the condensers and the receiver. The receiver is generally going to be in the motor room down by the compressors. And so that's why they call it a drop leg, because it drops down from the condensers to the receiver. And you would have this headmaster control, and this headmaster control would open up and allow discharge gas to enter the liquid line in order to drive up that liquid line pressure only when necessary. That is a way of helping to increase 
your head pressure, especially in you know, more extreme situations. And again, you're really only going to see headmasters in refrigeration applications. But I figured while we're talking about low ambient conditions, it's worth mentioning. And then finally, you don't leave this installed, but if you're testing a system where you want to check a system in cool mode when it's really cold outside, so you have a straight cool system, you want to check its operation, then a common thing to do is to block off the condenser, modulate the condensing fan motor in some way, or use Fieldpiece makes a jacket that you can actually put on top. It's like a little tent that you can put on top of the outside unit, and you can modulate the airflow through the condenser in order to drive the head pressure up to something like 105 degree condensing temperature. You know, that's a good general number, 105, 110, something like that. It equates to a good hot day. You drive that up to that point, and you just kind of hold it there while you let the system run, and then you check subcooling. Obviously, in a piston system, that's going to be really challenging to do. On a TXV, you're just going to check subcooling. So getting a target superheat under those conditions would be exceptionally difficult if you were doing it on a a piston system. So I don't advise doing that to set a charge in perfectly, but if you just want to check and make sure the system's generally functioning properly, that's a way that you can do it. If I had to, say, set up a piece of equipment, I was starting a piece of equipment in the winter, I would set up to come during the first warm day and come actually do a full commissioning on it once the outdoor temperature is above 65 degrees. So I try not to set in a cooling charge until that outdoor temperature is above 65 degrees, again, as much as possible. But you can use some of those strategies to kind of test, especially if you've done some work and you just want to make sure that everything else is working okay, then that's a good practice is to block off that condenser or modulate that condenser air in some way. And like I said, take a look at that field piece jacket. It's a pretty interesting little device. Jim Bergman did a video on that several years back that was pretty convincing on its utility. So there we have it. That is low ambient conditions. I'm sure there are other products out on the market that I did not mention, but hopefully you found this helpful, even if it was not fully comprehensive. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. (laughs) 